Greetings and welcome to Maisha Kazini. Today we are honored to have Joe Kobuthi, who is a curator at The Elephant and a trained philosopher. And our discussion today is going to be about philosophy and its relevance to Kenyan life. So, Karibu Joe. Uh, thanks, thanks, Wandia, for having me. Yeah, this is a conversation we've been saying we'll have for, for so long. So I'm glad we are finally here. Finally happening, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now I've, I've said that you are a philosopher. So maybe you can tell us how did that happen? Because many of us don't know people who have done philosophy. So you did your master's in philosophy mm. at University of Nairobi. So tell us how you even thought that you could do something like that. I mean, I think like, uh, like, like, I mean, like many, many Kenyans, I think uh, my giant philosophy was an accident. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, planned uh, and neither did I stumble on it by mentorship or anything. I think it was really by accident. So uh, take us back. I mean, uh, for people who went through, you know, 844, uh, particularly in primary school, uh, you know, there, there were these books that we used to buy, the Cartasi brand. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. And yeah, and and behind and be, I don't know if they still have them, but behind the books, there used to be those two, those two, I don't know if they still do that, but those to be people, those two uh, particularly thinkers. So I remember uh, there was one for Isaac Newton, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, Albert Einstein behind the book, behind the book. So I remember yes. like, I used to spend, I would spend my time when I'm bored in class, because I mean, it was all, uh, I mean, there's a lot of notes. I would, I would, I would spend time looking at, at these people. So I would see you know, Albert Einstein, you know, I'm saying a physicist, scientist, thinker. So I think, I, I know, it, I, I stumbled on Louis Pasteur, who uh, was, you know, he was a scientist, but then they also said he was a philosopher. So I think that's how actually I stumbled into, mm -hmm. into actually, no, 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 not in class, but just by looking at it, I realized, oh, this is interesting. And then my mm -hmm. curiosity and my love for history, I think, uh, moved then. So what happened was, when I joined campus, uh, I was going to study uh, economics and uh, political science and history. But then I, I was, I was, you know, because I mean, I didn't know when the faculty of arts is supposed to pick a, a third discipline. So, so I, I, my two disciplines were tight, which were, I mean, I was going to political science and economics, but then I had to pick a third one. So uh, I, stumbled, I stumbled, I was walking and I stumbled with this department and I was like, this is, it, it clicked a bell. I think something in me clicked. This is the stuff I was to read about. That was when I signed up, and that's how my journey in philosophy started. And okay. then, you know, that's how the journey in philosophy started. It was nothing uh, epoch making. It was just just ordinary, ordinary connecting, ordinary dots. All right. So we are talking about just to clarify for Kenyans that at the back of the Karatasi brand exercise books, the mm. the the publisher used to put stories of thinkers, philosophers, mm. and that's scientists. how you, scientists, yeah. It's just occurred to me that they were so European. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they precisely. never put Kenyans. No, 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 but yeah, precisely. And uh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think even, because even, I mean, uh, a lot of how philosophy is taught, even in Kenyan, Kenyan a lot of it is Western philosophy. So mm. there's, there's very little uh, non-Western non -Western philosophy, thinkers from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and that, that one studies here. So it's still very European. So before we get to the, the what is it called? Before we get to, to the curriculum that you were exposed to, now when you, when you did philosophy at a master's level, what was, your, what was your interaction with Kenyans? Did people ask you why? Are you doing mm. philosophy? Was it strange to them? Were there any people who said you should do something more marketable? Mm. So, I mean, so, uh, so I mean, uh, to answer your question, I think that that was largely in my undergrad because, I mean, people would ask you, okay, so what did you do with that? You know, and, and I mean, now looking back, I mean, we're a very capitalist society and we're, we're a very action oriented society because we're in a capitalist society and philosophy is a fairly reflective discipline, you know, it's fairly, fairly reflective. So there's always that, that back and forth, like what did you do with this, what did you do with that? Uh, but then I, when I finished my undergrad, you know, did, did a couple of years working, uh, I mean, I, I, I first did a master's in public policy, <laughs> public policy, uh, but then I think I got disillusioned when I finished it because 
uh, in my view, it, it, it had certain assumptions uh, towards how public life should happen that my reality wasn't you know. So in my, to my mind, I thought perhaps if I go back into philosophy, it will give me the tools to, to try and unpack how public life should happen. Uh, because uh, again, because of the public policy curriculum in many institutions in Kenya is uh, the, the fundamental logic, the certain assumptions it makes, you no, know, a functioning welfare state, uh, a bourgeoisie that cares for its people. Uh, the, the terms of engagement is uh, what you get about a philosopher called uh, uh, critical critical debate theory, where it's a give and take. But my experience is, as my daily experience as a Kenyan is far from that. So I went back to, to do philosophy as a master's level to try and try and get uh, those normative tools to try and unpack how public life actually should happen or what I actually experience and try and give it a logic. Okay, I'm really interested in that because uh, when I was reading your thesis, I was wondering how did these questions that you're asking about politics come out? But now I, now I see that it's connected to the fact that there were assumptions your, your, your experience in public policy was making and yet those assumptions were, were not questioned. Exactly. Wow. So you decide to take a master's in philosophy. <laughs> what did mm -hmm. people say? Was there any I, I, backlash or questions? I mean, so I mean, so at the time I was doing uh, uh, philosophy, I was I was working I was working in a local church. So I mean, so I mean, so one one can only one can only imagine. Uh, I mean, the, the the church in Kenya is fairly hostile. conservative, exactly. And hostile and conservative. To philosophy. Exactly. So it's so it's so it's. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But but mm -hmm. there's always a sense of are you going to, are you becoming? You know, are you this? You know what what the church doesn't understand spiritualizes. You know, particularly the Kenyan church. Mm. So is it a stronghold? Is, it, is it, are you becoming demonic? Uh, you know, is it what are you gonna do with this thing? Are you gonna become a radical? You know how. So I think that there was that question. Then also, I think just, but still, I mean, even in that space, there's still also very well-meaning people who I think have taken a particular journey and, and realized the space for thinking in our society. But, but I think generally we, still, we have a long way to go in terms of appreciating uh, thought, thought and ideas as a society. So I think that that's always a thing where what do you do with ideas, you know, in a society like mm -hmm. this, where, yeah. where, the way to get rich is 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 through primitive accumulation. So mm. it's you know it's it's you know buy the lar the, the largest sand mine and, and mine sand. <laughs> Not yeah. So we our society is fairly 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 uh, antagonistic to ideas and thought of any kind. So why you many in your class as no 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 we have I mean that's that's we were, we were three I mean I remember even in my undergrad I mean the, our biggest classes were perhaps six or seven uh, six or seven and which is interesting and I tell people this is that in my masters out of our were four actually two three three of the three of the four were actually uh, one was a priest a Catholic priest and the two had begun their journey to the seminary but had left the seminary. So they were so, connected to the Catholic Church. I, precisely, precisely. And you, you never had any fununu among your age mates, as you know, like you know, what could explain why either they did is it that they didn't know there was such a thing as philosophy, or they had certain perceptions of it, and that's why they were not taking the classes. I think. I think. A, a failure, one of the failures of, I mean, of how we train our 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 education system, is that it's it's. I mean, it's just give you, give you an example. Just like these elections, uh, and I think one of the assumptions that I when I went back to philosophy, as uh, public life is actually addressing this, is that because of how colonialism happened, you know, how colonialism happened, you know, look at 1905 and Maasai Agreement, the Maasai's were cheated. And then 19, 1907, the Embu people in the Embu war, they were cheated. Uh, some way, he, was, he was meeting my hearts again. He was cheated. You know, uh, the independence project was, 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 a lie. was a lie. So because of that, 
people move people move towards public life first and foremost as an emotion. And, and I think this, this is why Fanon says in the last chapters, oh, my body, let me not forget this, is because in a society that has been colonized, has been, culture has been, has been fragmented, the, the only true thing that people know is their feeling. And it's a, it's a thing, it's a thing that one sees in, for instance, in our elections, right? I mean, we're not talking about manifestos and all these things, but everybody has already decided who they're voting for. Based on how they feel. Based on how you feel. So like, for instance, in this election, the two, the two biggest emotions driving us is fear uh, or madarao, right? So because, I mean, to be very, you know, very real, very real is that the madarao, particularly around what the current dynasties, uh, Uru Kenyatta, what he has done to people, you see, I mean, the family, that whole, you know, people feel this, this dynasty is their children's body, so the mother out. But on the other hand, because of the deputy president and how his, his idiosyncrasies and his connection to the Nyayo regime, is that there's a visceral fear towards him. Hmm. That's, how we are, that's how we are voting. Anything else is fluff. Anything else justifies those emotions. Mm -hmm. So to, 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 to take us back to how we pick our courses, it's picked on emotion. So I saw my uncle being happy and he was happy because he was rich. He was rich because he was an engineer while doing engineering. So, so, so that, that's how we move in our society. You know, that's how we move. It's, it's, it's the reason why, you know, it's the reason why in the left we have the reflection section because we, we recognize the power of emotion, the power of, that you have to start public policy in, colonize societies first and foremost from emotion and then move the conversation to that because that's the only thing that people know is real everything else we have everything else I mean, a lie. is a lie you know it's a lie you know who i told uh, a big four agenda <laughs> where is big four agenda who i told i mean mm. so, so so like your 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 classmates or or age mates when they hear philosophy, what does that evoke for them? Insecurity or what does that do? I mean, to be, to be not, not to be, I mean, for my classmates, I mean, because I mean, I said, you know, the classmates are coming from the Catholic tradition. So that's, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. But for, for, but for everybody else, it's a sense of blankness. Okay. Like what, what's that? Like, I mean, it's, it's, yes. it's a sense of blankness because, because, Again, philosophy, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's a, it occupies, uh, you know, the realm of what, I know, it, the philosopher Immanuel Kant calls uh, the, the noumena, things we don't see and we can't perceive of them. So, and because for, for societies like ours, because of our particular history with, uh, with, with colonialism and, you know, this 500 years slavery to see, it doesn't ring a bell, it doesn't ring anything. It doesn't ring anything. Okay, just just to uh, to stretch now that that argument. Um, when I was uh, I had more responsibilities. I used to invite artists and and uh, public figures to come and talk to students about their careers, and then of course these people would say, "I studied the arts. This is what I did in school." How come even that doesn't register? Because if they attach emotions to their uncles who did um engineering or did medicine how come when there's an uncle who has or an auntie who has done the arts it still doesn't register mm. Mm. so so when to touch about this emotion and uh peter peter Eke, peter Eke, the political scientist you know also the, the colonialism and two publics yeah where he talks about you know the two public the, the because of colonialism there was you know the primordial sphere the civic sphere and then the private sphere Mm -hmm. The arts, unfortunately, because of because of that aberration, don't have a foothold in the don't have a foothold directly in in the civic sphere, and therefore can't translate to a particular benefit to the primordial sphere. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Because I mean, and a very a very good example. Uh, in every village, I mean, now because of good evolution, now things are urbanizing, but in every village, there were two people who 
occupied in the civic sphere who got out of legitimacy in the primordial sphere. This was the doctor and the priest. Mm -hmm. So because of that, decisions are made, even education decisions are made in terms of how do I get, how do I move in the, in the civic sphere so that I can, I can accumulate whatever it is, whether it's a particular kind of degree, whether it's money, whether it's power, it's resources, so that I can get my legitimacy in the primordial sphere. Mm -hmm. And but since uh, again, this is also just because we, since our 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 human hum, uh, our humanities courses don't reflect the primordial sphere, there's no relevance. So, meaning, even if you take the arts, the the people at back at home, they, there's no connection in the public sphere between what you did and how your what your status is. Exactly. Basically. Exactly. I mean, I remember, this, and, and just to to an, another example, maybe to help, maybe bring this home. I remember it was Churchill, you know, Churchill, the comedian, who oh, yes. always say his mother used to always call him and tell him get a job. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Get a like. Saying hey, I've connected yeah. you to so and so. Yeah. Get a job. I give you a job. Exactly. Get a job. That's it. <gasps> mm. Ooh. That's violence because. It means that even when you see things, you have to keep on unseeing them because exactly. it doesn't connect to what you, your impression of what the public sphere is. So you exactly. have to keep on seeing things. You see someone, you see he's doing well, but you keep telling yourself, no, that can't be the arts because that's not what I hear Matiangi saying. And Matiangi, exactly. by the way, he has a PhD in literature, but oh Lord, that's a lot of violence. It's psychic violence. Exactly. It is, it is. Okay, mm. so so you did your 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 thesis on uh, Fanon. Mm. So maybe you can just tell Kenyans who Fanon is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, Franz Fanon was his 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 full name, and he had a third name. Uh, Franz had a third name. I forget. Uh, but Franz Fanon generally was was born he was an Algerian psychiatrist. And philosopher, but not a philosopher in the in the trained way like 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 I have been, because he was trained as a, as a psychiatrist, uh, Algerian militant uh, philosopher, uh, born in the island of Martinique. You know, Martinique was was off the Caribbean. Those are then those are French colony. So I think Fanon was, I mean, born in what was then you no know, call I mean, you know, what you call a middle class bourgeoisie family, and then I think, and he was. Like, like kids in that class were just, they're being prepped to the, the assimilado uh, way of French colonialism where they get a few a few people from the communities which they colonize and prop them up. So I think, and he was going through that journey, but I think uh, what is, to, what is to, to note is he, how he stumbled with, how he's, he's, he, he met a teacher, MSSR, who, who, who I think began his journey with him uh, around negritude and blackness, began his Began his taking, began asking deeper questions about his society. So I think so. His first intellectual takeoff point was that space of, uh, from his first term, SSR talking about negritude and blackness and black thought, etc. And then, I think he was a restless soul. So uh, at some point, he moved to the University of Lyon, and when he studying psychiatry, is when he 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 hobnobbed a lot with the French left. So. People, Jean Paul Sartre, who wrote uh, the previous to he, one of his seminal works, uh, Legend of the Earth. Uh, but then what happened is that now, when again, that was a second takeoff point from there, is when now he was trying to organize the French left, because now he's on that platform with French left and Marxism in particular. But he realized the French left, uh, they were okay when they were talking about uh, talking about uh, distribution of empire, but they were not okay when, you thought, when they were when he was bringing up the conversations on. The plight of what now he calls uh, "legend of the earth." You know, you know, French. There's a French word how it says "legend of." So that's what, again. He is. He's actually takeoff point to now what what uh, scholars are calling the colonial thinking because they realize no, no, no. Uh, you guys are with us to a certain point, but you're not with us when now we're talking about the plight of the people from the from from you know the global south. He began he began writing and from after he finished his University of Lyon, he came to Africa. Uh, became a psychiatrist in, in Algeria. He joined the the revolution in Algeria, and when he was doing that, he also started organizing. He was writing. He was organizing uh, conferences uh, from you know about uh, Africa coming together, etc. And I think 
and I think that was, that was really his 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 that was, that was really a lot of his work was done. You know, uh, his seminal work, uh, Pledged of the Earth, Isolation and Freedom, which he wrote on his Algeria, uh, Black Skins, White Mask. He wrote it was his thesis, which was rejected when he was in Lyon and wrote something else. But I think a lot of his work happened in interface when he was in Algeria studying the human condition of what colonialism can do to our people. So mm. in his act of being a psychiatrist, he, he began to see certain patterns in the human condition, both to the colonized and to the colonized. The colonizer. Because he was seeing uh, the French and the Algerian patients who are coming to the psychiatric hospital, they had trauma from yes. the colonial relationship. And then he figured, hey, this is not a, a biological medical problem, it's a social medical hey. problem. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you discover him? How did you know about him? Because, hey, mm. is this Kenya? <laughs> People don't know who Fanon is. I remember uh, the, the books we had by Fanon, we were buying them uh, for the library, I think, just like 10 years ago. Mm. Mm. So, so how I, did you hear about him? So, I mean, I heard, I mean, so I think there's two things for me. One is what I heard about him and, and studied in this mm. university, that is what I and un I understood him out of the university. So I had him when I they was. They mentioned my... him in your classes. Yes. Oh, yes. So at least in, you they in, did. In my, in my second year, in my second year of philosophy, there's a course yeah. undergrad called uh, social and African social African social and political thought. Oh, okay. So yeah, so you study you, you Fanon is mentioned, Kruma, I mean just uh, uh, Nyerere, uh, Sengo, you know, Sengo, you know. Yeah, so he was mentioned there. But I mean, it was mentioned, but I understood him again after when I was out of campus, again, trying to begin to understand my context. Mm -hmm. uh, I was now reading him for myself out of campus, now being to understand that he's saying something that is important to me uh, as an African young man uh, today. Mm. Mm. Did, did uh, when you are doing the public policy, did he come up? Did no, no, no. Come up? No, no, no. So I remember a funny story, funny story. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I remember once I did a, I did a presentation when I was doing public policy and a uh, course called Law and Governance. <laughs> and I did a presentation on Fanon and my professor then, you know, was very uncomfortable and he said, hey, this is good, a good presentation, but hey, it's a bit too rad radical. <laughs> uh so it was those kind of co comments that now really got me, ticked me off to now start asking myself much deeper questions around exactly what is uh the assumptions we are making here that are not that are not are not correct for our society okay mm. what is that is so now you decide if somebody has already said that but you still <laughs> decide you're going to do your thesis on fanon what was the experience like mm. well, i think i think you know because i mean and I think this is now now looking back, understanding is the institutions, our Kenyan universities were built by the British by and large. The mm -hmm. curriculum, the curriculums, the logic of the institutions and the logic of the institutions were to perpetuate colonialism or in this sense, coloniality. Mm -hmm. you know, it was to train people for the civil service, train bureaucrats for, for work, it was to train uh, Africans to be better laborers, but within the architecture of coloniality. So that's, 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 that's the logic of even our universities today. And Fanon and many other thinkers uh, uh, were the colonial thinkers. So because of that, writing about him in a colonial space, there's, 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 there's going to be friction because you're introducing, introducing a different logic into an institution that was not was built for a particular kind of system. Mm. So there's, there's always going to be a, a tension there. There's always mm. going to be a tension there that this, this is an idea that this, this space uh, desires. It was not built for this kind of ideas. Mm. Mm. Okay, so we can go to what you were saying about the fact that uh, philosophy is uh, dominated by uh, either people who are priests or had been planning to be priests, which is something even uh, Mudimbe talks about in uh, 
an invention of Africa. Yeah. Mm. How did that happen? So, I mean, so one day, a, a history lesson here is, I mean, Kenya, and like, I mean, comparing with uh, America, Kenya is a theological project. Uh -huh. Ameri America as a state is a humanistic project. You know, by the yeah. time the European immigrants, because they were immigrants, then they were going to America, they were, they were leaving the kings and the church behind. And so the American experiment was a humanistic experiment. Mm -hmm. Kenya, on the other hand, is a theological, was a theological experiment. First, in 1498, Vasco da Gama lands in, in Mombasa, right? And he puts up Fort Jesus. That's, and, 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 and the precursor to that was in 1492, uh, Pope Alexander VI, the VI divides the world into two between the Spanish and the Portuguese. And now they, they say, okay, half the world is yours, half the other world is yours, the treaty of, of Tessadolis. So half the world is yours, the other half is yours. And then of course, now the Portuguese are sending their people to them, they're looking for India because they've had, they have be, been hearing about this civilization that has just reached with gold and ETC. And the Spanish, again, as they're looking for the El Dorado, they, they go into the Americas. Again, because they are they're now, the medieval times, work, there were so many myths about the wild outside of Europe. So now, these guys are now going to find those worlds to, to become to, to become rich. So the Pope gives Vasco da Gama, the Pope and the six gives Vasco da Gama a charter to, to come to, to go to Africa and to just all the way to India. He lands in Mombasa and he erects Fort Jesus. So Fort Jesus is actually Fort Jesus is actually a V first. It's it's the entry point. We don't one of Western of of Western European colonialism as a, as to Kenya as a theological project. You know, I've never even considered it's called Jesus. Yeah, it's Fort Jesus. Yeah, Fort I Jesus. Do. But, oh, but it was there was actually there was actually a mark that they were saying this land is yes. I mean it's it's for the king and to God. So it was a, that's that's actually the mark. And then what we have is essentially of course now with the slavery period, DTC, and we know very many slaves were living in the coast of East Africa through Luanda to West Africa. And then the British come in the 18th century with the missionaries and their agenda is to end slave trade because it's not Christian. Mm -hmm. And I know Joao Misi and other people have wrote about it, the wretched Africans, you see, and, and we know that story. And so you have, and then what they do is that now the colonial experience was not just to civilize Africans, but also was to, was to convert them to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So then what you have from that trajectory, you now see, of course, now in 1920, Kenya becomes a colony. But the underlying logic of, of Kenya is purely theological. And when I mean theological, uh, it's Western Christian theology with all, its, uh, with all its dark sides and good sides, you know, racism, ETC. So, okay, can I so just what, pause there? Mm. Where does the business side come in? How does it interact with that theological project? Because remember, mm. the Kenya colony was first the British Imperial British Imperial East African. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, so I mean, so I mean, I, I don't want to. I mean, when I talk about even uh, in 1492 and the Pope was dividing the world into two, uh, four things happens there, right? When he divides the world into two, first something happens internally in Europe, which is the 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 expulsion of the, the, the Jews and the, the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula. And then tied to that, uh, tied to that is the, the slave trade begins to happen years later, and then the discovery of Americas. This, these four events together uh, create what the colonial scholars calling a, a colonial matrix of power. And, and this matrix of power has certain, it, it, it's, it's a web, so it's it's it has certain characteristics, right? You know, it's you know being imbued out of you know patriarchal and theological foundations. But one of the key things of this matrix of power is the racial capitalism. Okay. So now, so even as they are moving with this theological conversion, it's still part of this package, and part of it is is racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. So when in British East Africa, as they there's as they are civilizing, so part of the civilizing mission introducing racial capitalism but also part of it is also uh, because introducing, introducing 
and not just Christianity, but it's particularly Western Christianity, mm. you know, because because it it moves the matrix of power moves together. It's not it's 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 a, it's a web, and it has different variation derivatives as it as it moves through society. Mm. So this this, this so this is how these two come together. But then now to to, to tie into that now is that now uh, the colonialists come again. Kenya's a theological project. So when many of these universities were being built in the, and mission schools, uh, mission schools, mm. civil service, etc., it was we know it was a, it was Africans who converted to Christianity, who who became who got the jobs in civil service, in the mission schools, etc. But then it was all, and then so it's now now and now uh, Kenya is not preparing for independence. Now we have 1930s with this African community. We have University of Dar es Salaam, Makerere, University of Nairobi. Uh, the faculty at the specific department of philosophy university of nairobi was begun by catholic priests it was catholic priests who actually were the first teachers lecturers at the university of nairobi hence uh the first cadre of of really some of them really great minds like my late professor nyasani was actually trained by the catholic he was actually i think also wanting at some point wanting to become a catholic priest but because of the journey he did and became an academic. So very many of them are. So the logic is the Catholic priests who, who hold that. And today, to date, philosophy in Kenya is held by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. If the Catholic, because the Catholic Church are the only institution in Kenya that require philosophical training to be a priest. Mm -hmm. So if the Catholics decide tomorrow they no longer want to, to be in Kenya, philosophy in Kenya collapses. So philosophy in Kenya is at the uh, is a tool of the theological project that is Kenya. Well, so okay, <laughs> so it's dominated by the Catholic Church. What explains this hostility of the Protestant evangelicals mm. to philosophy? Ignorance, ignorance, uh, mm. complete. So because I mean, you know, complete ignorance. Because I mean, uh, it has, I think it's completed. I mean, and, and I think it has a particular history. I, I'm I'm not I'm not a scholar or but yeah. in evangelical pro properly. But I think it's complete ignorance because of again, evangelical evangelical churches are fairly nascent church within. If you look at the long durée of Kenyan history, I mean, it comes properly, properly it really steps into Kenya properly properly with with uh, structural adjustment programs oh yeah the name so that, exactly and and i think uh it was uh professor uh obadie 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 a nigerian professor scholar uh, i forget obadie who, who wrote a who wrote a paper uh, uh titled uh the, the 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 pastor as a sexual object so in that this paper he 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 explains and he says uh, something happened in the 80s when such adjustment happened was that uh, uh, such adjustment happened and then of course we had to cut back on spending it is so that the, the state had to had to shrink so we cut back on education on health uh, many many and many other social services but something that happened was that uh, the academy was hit because now we had to cut back on education so professors knowledge producers professors, uh, academics had to leave the academy to now, and if they were there, they had to become uh, hustlers. And this is what, you know, Pastor Lokantai talks about in his article, The Class Generation, where now everybody is now becoming a hustler. So, and and we, and this is when we see the, the invention of what Mamdani says, the invention of the academic as a consultant. So now they now move and they become, so they're not, they're not, they're not producing knowledge, they're now writing concept papers and doing programs for NGOs and donors, DC. But that 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 gap was filled, was was that vacuum was filled by the evangelical pastor. Mm. Hmm? Was filled by the evangelical pastor. So he became, as according to the article, he became, you know, the knowledge he talks about money, illiteracy, sex, you know, like, you know, he's a one-stop shop, one-stop knowledge, knowledge, knowledge house. He became, he became that. Uh, he became that. So their, 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 their instinctive insecurity towards not just philosophy, but I think broadly speaking, knowledge production comes because they know that they occupy an, a space society that was never theirs to begin with, where, you know, 
you you are you it was really uh you you are you are your success came because of the failure of of because of of SAPs that hit you know what no that hit the African continent so th- mm. that's where the insecurity comes from particularly around the evangelical uh, the evangelicals and that's why there's a there's a fear of knowledge uh, their the logic is a certain fear of no not just philosophy but just knowledge broadly yes. because of yeah. this space yeah. that they occupy. And, and I think, and I think, just my own opinion, I think uh, the 2010s really wiped them out because of now the advent of technology. Now they no longer occupy that space in society anymore as as the knowledge producers. And but it's also embedded in the evangelical theology because I know, like in the U.S., the evangelical scholars have had to tell people, no, uh, the fact that we are Christians doesn't mean that we should stop thinking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. so that ju- that seed of hostility to knowledge was already embedded in evangelical theology, and so when it comes to Kenya, it just becomes worse. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. It, it, meet, it meets our conditions, and it finds mm. when, it, when it comes to Kenya, when it when it, it comes to Kenya to replace uh, the the professor, and then it just becomes so. There's 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 a natural there's an instinctiveness within their own within because it, as a, as an as an import from America, but then again it's just it's just exacerbated just because of just the fear of thought within yeah. within, evangel- within the evangelical church broadly speaking mm. i don't know whether we want to mention also hostility to theology because even the very evangelical church doesn't like theology it mm. says it's anti-god we don't need to think god is what we feel as long as we feel the spirit we are okay yeah, I mean, I think that that one has to connect that with, with, I mean, the, the evangelical church. I mean, coming from America, has a very very dark roots. I mean, ah. it, be, it, 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 it 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 being a tool for mm. for slavery in America. You know, mm. we, I mean, one reads Alice Walker and realizes how Negroes Negroes who could read who could read were lashed. So you know, their the visceral fear of of mental anything mental. Comes because or intellectual, they, yeah. Exactly, came because I mean they, they they because of just I think it was Du Bois who, who says no, there's, there's, a, there's a certain viscerality towards uh, seeing yourself, and I think knowledge does that for you. So I think uh, mm, mm, I think that's why the, 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 the dark roots of the evangelical church, you know, in America, really come from really come from just a very dark place, a very dark fear of you know there. It was really the, the religion of slavery, you know, that, that they justified, you know, 400 years of, of complete brutish, brutish barbarity towards, a, towards their fellow king. Mm. Hey, so uh, maybe might you know anything about the fate of uh, philosophy in terms of in, in, in Kenyan universities, in terms of uh, lecturers, how big the departments are? What's your general sense? Maybe you don't have to give us the, the data, but what's your general sense of how philosophy has fared in Kenyan universities? Mm. I think actually that there was data. I remember it was a, a Commission of Education and KNBS, I think 2019, actually they aggregated uh, uh, courses, how many people are in, uh, are, are in Kenya. And philosophy was, was top, was bottom five in terms of the arts and social sciences, really bottom five. And even what scared me most was, was that the Catholic Church really has a foothold, a foothold in Kenya. So I was, I was asking myself, if we remove the priests, who remains? Mm. Remove the priests and the lecturers, who remains? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's really, I think, I think, I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I think, I think, and it, generally speaking, I think just for the humanities, I think if you remove like li- in literature, for instance, if you look at the same data. Uh, by see one one as you remove the the teachers who teach who remains do we have a literary producers of knowledge outside of you know the high school teachers who teach our young people literature in schools who remains so i think there's also because it because again as i said because kenya is a theological project and because it's based on 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 a theology of 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 racism of coloniality etc I think generally this, this is this this is the this is the tension that I think knowledge has to con- constantly contest with, particularly in Kenya. Mm. 
Mm. I don't know which question to ask you next. Uh, maybe you can decide. My two next questions are, what is philosophy and what does it do? But the other one is, uh, connected to your thesis, how did you come up with the idea of independence without liberation from a philosophical perspective? I don't know which one comes mm. first. What do we have to talk well, about I think, first? I think if we follow the academic way, I think definitions come first. <laughs> okay, all right. So we can start with what is philosophy and what does it do? Mm. I think I think broadly I don't broadly speaking philosophy is really the study of the being or the self and how this self understands the world around them relates with people and also understands the world that they can see which 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 that's the what what philosopher says metaphysics I think broadly speaking it's really the it's meditation of really pursuit of understanding a pursuit of understanding of of life and life life at a very uh, no, no, not just existentially, but even at the, the essential elements of life. Uh, you know, academically, I mean, you can, can say it's really a study of first principle. You know, the things that make things the way things happen. Mm. Yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's really just, I mean, to truly really help, you know, study of first principle too. So you can go to the, the things that really, you know, the invisible hand, as Smith, Adam Smith called it, to be able to the level of, of 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 understanding you know the bible which is interesting uh, the the evangelists don't don't like it but i mean i think the book of proverbs and the book of job actually philosophical texts you know mm -hmm. proverbs one you no know, you know proverbs one you know uh solomon status says my son lean your heart unto understanding you know uh, yeah mm. you know so it's, it's really and, and this connects even to what socrates what talks about you know is the pursuit of truth and understanding so i think they're really is really a meditation of how society is, but also how the self is. So how does a society do philosophy? Um, mm. Yeah. Is it just uh, that you have to go to school to learn it? Or what, what in our communities and, and our daily life is philosophical? Mm. I, think, I think, in fact, <laughs> I, think, I think the best who do the philosophy are the worst philosophers. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, like I mean, our I mean, look at our history. The people who really didn't do philosophy: Fanon, uh, oh, for yeah. instance, Fanon, Albert Einstein. You know, the people who I mean, because I think it's that I think was really playing with matters of first principle. And mm. I think philosophical thought, in that sense, is really a society uh, asking itself uh, conversations about its 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 origins. How it relates with itself, where it's going, how it plans, and how it relates with other communities, how it also sees the world, and how the world sees it. Mm. So I think that that I think that that uh, at a level of society, that's where philosophy philosophy needs to come in. How do we our understanding of ourselves and and, and our place in the world? Uh, so I think that that's that's how philosophy needs to come in because of a society. Uh, uh, I think a disclaimer. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just my own thought, but. Outside of just, I mean, our historical context, why philosophy and also our context, our context why philosophy is not, is not growing. I think this is something to say about societies that have been colonized or slaves. There's something about thought that is stifled. And especially yes. societies that are, it's not just uh, physical shackles, but they are, they are mental shackles mm. whereby your colonizer or your the person who dominates you wants you to think in their mode of context. Mm -hmm. so that's in my, in my view why also philosophy in Africa is not taking off because there's a conversation of there's a still a conversation about our freedom that we have not answered. You know, <laughs> of late I've been uh, not very patient with the cliches. Mm. And I've noticed that uh, there's, a, there's a hostility in the Kenyan, the normal Kenyan conversations. There's a hostility to questioning the kind of interpretations we get. And people accept uh, whatever explanation they get for anything from the media, especially, and maybe mm. the judge. So how does that relate to philosophy? What, what's happening with Kenya? that makes us so susceptible 
to ex accepting explanations and not wanting them to be questioned. So, so I mean, which is, which is tied to the next question. Mm. Uh, Franz, Franz Fanon, in one of his books, Southern African Revolution, uh, actually said that uh, Kenya is a perfect colony. And, and he actually went to explain what he meant, whereby he said that, that, that those people, there's a level of mental subjugation they have, they have overtaken, that they, are, they now they have embraced uh, Western ideas, concepts, and ideals. Uh, to use to use uh, Malcolm X in a sense is almost like we are we're the proper house niggers, you know, and and I think that acceptance of our servitude is is why it explains the Kenyan condition, mm. because there's being a house nigger. There are there also parts of being a house nigger. You didn't do too much work in the field, you know. You didn't do too much work in the in the field. You didn't, you know. You had maybe three or four meals. You are closer to the master. Uh, so I think. That, that 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 acceptance is it's it's Stockholm syndrome at a societal level where we have accepted the, the fate of our of our kidnapper. Mm. 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 Ah, you know, of course, you've reminded me. Even uh, at some point, I remember, even and maybe you could talk about this in terms of what it does to our education system. I also noticed that. Um, Books or thesis on philosophy of education in Kenya are so few. And mm. even the ones that you get, like there was one which I saw, which uh, horrified me, where the thesis was about how do we stop uh, kids from cheating in exams? <laughs> That's a mm. philosophical question. Oh, God. So what does that do when we are not taking philosophy seriously? I think it, it perpetuates uh, what uh, uh, Du Bois calls psychic turbulence. Mm. So, uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry, double consciousness, not psychic turbulence. Yes. Double, double consciousness. So it's, I mean, just like I mean, the the, the, the idea of you know this uh, Stockholm syndrome is uh, some, when when the the, the 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 person has been kidnapped falls in love with the kidnapper. You, you don't want if you if you if you come out of that context you might implode ah yes mm, mm. so because the love that they give you is 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 is, is toxic yes you, so coming out of that space you'll implode so you rather stay there you rather stay there mm. you, you do, because you, do, you don't know what happens it's almost like it's, kenya is almost like we're a trauma patient and we don't know we don't know we don't know where is is what uh i think uh uh <laughs> The psychologist, the psychologist, the cancer psychologist Chris Limo just said a few minutes ago, is that it's not, it's not uh, denial. It's, 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 it's the, it's the fear of, it's a fear of what happens if I accept the reality. Mm, mm. Mm, 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 what happens if I accept? So I think that that this is where a Kenyan society at a at a psychic level, for instance, so we rather live in this double consciousness state where you know we we. You know, we go. We are church going people. We are. We, are church we going get people. papers. We go we get. Praise the Lord. Yeah, but in, on Monday morning we are we are doing fifty billion deals, and our newspaper is a fifty billion Kenyan heist. Mm. So when a student comes into the education system, what is happening philosophically? What is being done to them? Mm. So I think good question. I think uh, I think this is Walter Rodney. How you going about? So I think what's happening to them at a, at a at a psychic level is one of course is the the socialization into coloniality into, into Western ways of thought practice uh, ways of being uh, through language uh, sensibilities constructing but since this student is an African and they occupy 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 the, uh, occupy an African reality Kenyan reality in this sense their soul is being divided. So their soul is not coming together. Their soul is being fragmented into very many parts. Yes. So it's the reason why the more, it's the reason why Fanon really hated the African bourgeoisie, you know, because they had, you know, in his chapter, you know, national consciousness, you know, and he really said, these guys will betray you. So your soul has been divided. So your, your, soul, your soul is in, it's not, I mean, uh, and 
I don't know if you've watched the watched or read the the movie Harry Potter. Watched or read the movie Harry Potter. Yeah, but but uh, in I hope your audience, I hope your audience uh, has watched it. But in but Lord Voldemort, who was I mean the you know the 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 is the, is the, the villain in the in the series. Uh, what he did to to remain evil, he divided his soul into seven parts. Divided his soul into into seven parts, so into seven horcruxes. So the whole series is actually Harry Potter going destroying all these parts. So I think, I think this is actually our the Kenyan the Kenyan the Kenyan educated mind's problem that your mind has been divided into very many parts. So you're able you're able to maintain you're able you able hence you're able to maintain this state of double consciousness and still live with yourself. You're able mm. to say praise the Lord on Sunday and on Monday. Uh, have a 15, 50 billion corruption heist. Mm. This obviously has an effect on our mental health. And uh, are you sensing, I don't know whether how much you've interacted with psychology in Kenya. Are you sensing that psych- the, the, psychology, the psychology and mental health conversations are covering that aspect of, of fragmentation? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, to be fair, no, because uh, because uh, in my view, I think the, the the mental health conversation has has already become it's become a conversation underguarded by big pharma. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so oh, yeah. So so we are we are we are treating we are treating a social problem with medicine. Mm. Treating mm, a social problem with medicine, so big pharma is throwing money at it, but it's a social problem. This is, this is a crisis of our, of our souls. Our, our souls are, are being fragmented into many parts, and we don't know where. We and we are we're trying to gather ourselves together. And how do we cope? In sort of Kenya, for instance, in my view, the alcohol, the problem is in, in alcoholism is not actually a problem of alcoholism. Mm. It's a problem of. Uh, the local Kikuyu man is unable to synthesize uh, the subjugation he's being undertaken by, you know, the Kikuyu big man, and he's and he's not getting the perks of that loyalty. So it's a double tragedy. It's what like it's what whiteness does in America. Before he destroys the the black folks, he first destroys the white folks. Mm. So in the same sense, you know, with the Marxist before he destroys. For destroys other communities, it has destroyed first its own community. So hence, particularly young men in Central Kenya uh, 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 are completely, you know, <laughs> they like their bottle a bit too much. Mm, mm. So this is, and this is a social problem. This is a problem of, of it, it's, an, it's, an, it's an ideology that is, uh, it has caged the Kikuyu man into a little box whereby your worth is primitive accumulation of capital. Mm. And then it doesn't, it doesn't uh, satisfy the soul, but exactly. even worse, you don't have access to it. So exactly. you're, you're battered both ways. Mm. Mm. So you implode internally. So you implode internally. So now how did you come to your thesis? <laughs> So, so I think it's it's again just I mean being a being a human being in my society, looking around and and especially the twenty tens because I mean I, I I mean I came of age you know my twenties were in the twenty tens, is you coming of you coming of age with a particular narrative that I was told growing up. So many of general Pata in Zuri. So looking at my peers and many of them. Having done that, mm. and, they have, and, and now to cope, they have moved into all kinds of vices. But then similarly, now appear into history, you're looking at, you're looking, it's almost like, I mean, there's a sense in which you feel society, you're stuck. You're looking at the struggles your, your father went through and you're going through the same struggles. And you're looking, he's telling you, he's telling you the stories of his father and the same struggles are, are feeling despite of of what our political elites and you know our you know political elites and you know history told by the state is saying that this progress is a sense of stuckness mm. in our society. Mm. So so because of that now I now the idea of liberation and 
Oh um, yeah, okay. Liberation. That's when I started thinking about these two ideas between mm. liberation and independence. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, grammatically, then we we put them as two as the same thing. Yeah, but, but they are I'm, not exactly. So now I said now looking particularly around. I said now reading what happened to other societies, and I read and I, particularly the works of uh, Wihano and Ibol Wihano, the Latin American Peruvian uh, scholar. He, he, he links the idea of independence, not, not of freedom of society, but of a contestation of a particular class of individuals within an oppressive system. Mm. So he, he talks about, now he links this particularly with the American Revolution, uh, the, of course, the British, the, British uh, the, 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 uh, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, uh, and, 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 and these two, and the British, but more so these two, the American and the French Revolution. And it says, if you look at uh, the American Revolution, it was, uh, it was independence because it was an internal struggle between uh, the terms of the conversation were between uh, male white Christians. So they were not, they were not, fighting for the end of coloniality of, of empire, which empire in itself is oppressive, but for a share of empire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same thing you will also see with the French Revolution, that uh, it, it, it was not for, it was not for the, the, the end of the French empire, but it was, uh, it was a class of individuals in the French empire who are, who are contesting for a space within empire. Hence, hence the limitations of the European left that, mm -hmm. that they, they can't articulate uh, their, their liberation is limited within European dominance. Yeah, actually, you know, I've been wondering why, because mm. of course the European left, the, I, I learned a lot of concepts for them. But when it comes to the state, it's like they can't imagine life without the state, the state mm. as we, the capitalist state as we know it. Exactly. Of course, of course, the European left also that that I uh Aren uh, Aren Hannah Aren actually talks about that in you know the in a book Age of Totalitarianism and she traces that and she mm. she she talk, she talks about that and she actually says you know because uh of course the the left the European left and the bo European bourgeoisie came out of one. They were the sons and daughters of people who came to plunder in the global south. Yes, it was, it was the conquistadors in Latin America. It was the guys who went to India to plunder. You know, it was you know it was in Africa. It was in all these places. So these guys move in here, and then they then in Europe power was centered uh, with the king, the feudal lords, and the church. But then now you have a class of people who have gone to the outside world and have come back with booty. And are now in, I mean, uh, Shashitarur actually in Glorious Empire puts it well. It says that there are actually a, a whole class of people who are buying their way into British normal, British noble gents. So if a guy goes to India, he's on loot. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. And now he says, I'm, I'm now, I'm now, I'm now Lord, Lord Emroy. You know, and this guy and his father was a nobody. So because of it's, it's how and this is how the bourgeois in Europe, Europe emerges, right? And for them, that is on why they and. Well, that's the, the 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 kings who they were contesting with were used, you know, the the empires, the bourgeoisie used the state. And this is why the European left can talk about the end of the state, because this was their tool in which they came to power. <laughs> that's what I have to process. Mm. Does that explain why they still have monarchies and in fact, I just keep wondering why the monarchy question, they seem paralyzed in dealing with it. Yeah, it was so, I mean, so I think, you know, because again, Hannah Arendt, she really talks, she'll explain this, she'll explain this well for me to understand, is that Europe, Europe was having an internal conversation in the medieval ages, and then they put it this conversation to the world in 1492. And this internal conversation was, was a contestation between the monarchy, the feudal lords, 
of course, copting the European church and the barons, you know, the barons and these guys, the henchmen, the guys were doing for them work. The henchmen were constantly not able to contest for power because there was always a question of legitimacy because, mm. you know, because uh, it was there, the, you know, the power was, was, was blood lineage. But these guys go, 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 go into the rest of the, go into the Americas, the Spanish going to go the Latin South America, you know, Africa, India, Asia, and they come back with plunder. But then, so this, so now they come back and contest, they contest power within this, with now as the, this, the monarchs are using the church and the, the bloodlines and all these things. And the bourgeoisie you now, the barons who have now, because of the now they've become bourgeoisie, are now using the state, using the state wealth. and wealth, but also mm -hmm. secular, secular, secular. Now at, the, at, the, at an epistemic level, they're now using secular thinking. enlightenment. Exactly, the enlightenment period to justify, to justify their place in society. Okay, just just go over that again. Yeah, just mm -hmm. go over that again. So I mean, so I mean, so I mean, mm. I mean to, to explain actually our, our world predicament today. Yeah, it, it's it's actually an internal conversation within Europe, and this, the whole it, world is having to what was absorbed into it exactly. So this internal conversation was on one hand, it was the, the European monarchy who appropriated the the the, uh, the, the European Western Church, Western Church. Uh, and, and of course, all the things that, that come with, you know, bloodlines, you know, you know, the kind of legitimacy, you know, father, son, all that stuff. And on the other hand, the barons, not they are the henchmen, who, because of their, their access to capital and wealth by plundering the rest of the world, were able to come to a point where they're able to now contest in this conversation. Now they are equals with now the, equals. the nobles. Yes. Exactly, but then the nobles are using, you know, the empires, the bourgeoisie are using the state. Okay, just explain that. What's the difference? So, because the, the monarchs, the the, 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 the the kings are using them, they are monarchs. So then they are, they have kingdoms. But now oh, okay. the bourgeoisie, now the barons who now come up, who now equals, then they're using the state to contest. What's the state? state? Is the state uh... the, the, the Westphalian state system, 1648, the Westphalian state system. Now, what they're now saying, now they're saying we are all men are equal and uh -huh. ETC. The Westphalian state system. They're using it to contest in this conversation with the monarchs. Okay, so just a, just because I really have to go down, you know. Mm. So the Westphalian state is made up of people who are employed in bookkeeping and law writing, I'm assuming. Exactly. So those are the ones who loot uh, places elsewhere and do their accounting books. Precisely. And bring, and that wealth, bring that wealth uh, back home. Exactly. And then their employers, quote unquote, are the ones who are now contesting with the nobles exactly. exactly and these nobles got their wealth from inheritance inheritance exactly okay uh -huh. exactly and 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 you're right these bookkeepers i mean to to, to be a, a, a very factual example i mean you're seeing uh the, the spanish the spanish um, the spanish king and queen catherine isabella and the king ferdinand sending columbus to America, but Loma is just a, just a guy, he's an explorer. But generations come, I mean, the guy, I mean, in, in, in America, I mean, you see the conquistadors became so rich that they actually changed politics in Spanish and in Portugal. Same thing in, in Britain. I mean, guys went to India, just normal guy, a seaman. You become so rich because you're a bookkeeper, and now you come back and see you now you're a nobleman. But that contestation, you now need institutions. This contestation, now, now both these, now these guys, well, there's one on a hand, they have, the monarchs have the, the empires and the church. These guys now use the state and secular thought to contest. This is the conversation we are stuck in. This is actually, if you trace this, is actually the Republican and the Conservative Party. This is actually Labour. And, and Tories. 
story. This is actually the LGBT and the anti-LGBT conversation. This is actually, uh, you know, you know, mm. uh, feminism and whatever masculinity. This is it. So we are stuck in one conversation, the whole world, p- between these two people. And you know, actually, the university has both elements. They have mm. this. The the content is this enlightenment, secular. I don't know what, what, what. But when we mm. graduate, we do the religious. We mm. do the cap and gown, the imperial. Because exactly. even the cap and gown are from, they are from the empire. Exactly. Not from, from the enlightenment. And like in France, if you look at the clothes, which, the, which is supposed to have been the home of the revolution, but the clothes which the French Academy wear, or the Academy mm. Francaise, they are clothes of royalty. And yet this mm. was a country that should have done away with, with the royal family. Mm. So, exactly. they, so those two are still an in a it's sense the conversation. Right. It's the because conversation. We, mm-hmm. It's the conversation that the yeah. whole world, that the whole world has been brought towards. So when they fight in other places, because these guys are still having, it's, the American Revolution was that conversation yes. between King George and the Enlightenment thinkers who are saying, no, 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 America is a republic. We are independent. And we don't want. We don't want to. Of course, it was. The, the, the political context was no tax was representation, and that's what historians tell us. But the epistemic context is the same, where you're having a contest between you know, the republic two, and the monarchy. Exactly. All under guarded under is an internal conversation to Europe that we have been forced to enter. Eh. What? So how would we? How would you read the the um, Hustler versus Dynasty? Is that not the same thing? We've been drawn the, into a conversation ab- which absolutely it's the same thing because if you look at the Hustler guys, they were the henchmen of the dynasty. Because what what happens in Kenya? Uh, Fanon talks about it very well in the preface of Richard of the Earth. Bring young male adolescents boys and teach them to schools and teach them to say Parthenon. Same thing with our bourgeoisie elite. You know, John Kenyatta went to London School of Economics and a village of anthropologist uh, uh, Mal, Mal, Mal Volesik, and we have all these guys. You no, know, so you have all this cluster of Africans who are sent abroad and become, you know, your first cadre of of the of the of African bourgeoisie. But then, century decades later, they have henchmen. You know, they have they have local henchmen. And we're saying that the Hasla conversations, and there's a lot of Hasla conversations are now saying, no, 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 we also have, they are, they are, they are able to accumulate enough wealth and power and legitimacy uh, within the system to now say, now we are, no, no, we, we, we also want to be, we also want equality, we also want to be part of the, 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 the thing. But it's, it's still that same, it's still that same logic of European imperialism, because that conversation has all been sucked into it. We all have that conversation in our own little corners, in, in, all, all, in all kind of de- uh, de- derivatives, you know, the Roe v. Wade, whatever it is. We, just, we are all stuck in one, that one useless conversation between, this, between Europeans. And even when you think of the degree uh, uh, controversy about whether same, people same have thing. degrees, you're actually saying, uh, on one hand, you have people who are saying, no, what matters is uh, the knowledge, but the others who are saying, what matters is that you are crowned. Exactly. It's the it's the same. Exactly. It's one. I'm royalty, and degree oh. makes me royalty. Yes. The other one. The other one. Uh, you know, I'm a henchman, and if I can do the job, then I don't need the degree. Same conversation. And we have, we have been stuck in this conversation for 500 years. Mm, we are. And we're we being, can't we're, get out of it. Yeah, we are being killed. We are being killed. We are being. You know, we are being killed. We are, uh, women are being raped. Our children are being destroyed just because of uh, an internal conversation that began in medieval Europe and we are stuck in that conversation. That's why, in fact, now you've, you've made me realize, that's why, you know, 10 years ago, I never thought that I would now start asking, why does Britain have a queen? <laughs> because I've started seeing the fact that there's a queen in, in Britain is affecting us. Mm. We are having to to deal with conversations which are not ours because 
Britain hasn't sorted out its no, issues haven't. with the monarchy. No, they haven't. And they, and they sucked the whole world into that conversation. They have plundered societies, destroyed, killed people just because of that conversation. But then, uh, don't you think then there, sh- there is a room for even us from the two thirds world to study their history? Because there seems to be this idea that first we should not study history and when we study it, we must, not, we must study only our own. Mm. But it seems okay. there is a room for us to actually start looking at their own history and saying, this is what happened here from our view. And this is what we need to do to get rid of these demons they've sent here. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was, it was what Rodney, who said that uh, to understand Africa, one is to understand Europe. What? Because we're st- we are stuck in this conversation that we can't get out of. Mm. And then if we try, we are told, oh no, you have to, we are, we're now it's almost like it's a, we are, we are, we are an audience. <laughs> we are audience only forced to be part of this conversation. That is, that, is, that is destroying us because they use, when, they, when there's conflict, they'll use all kinds of things from as, 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 as late as the Cold War, you know. So they will, they'll have hot wars in proxy hot wars, but not in their zones. In, in, so that in Africa, you know, we're seeing that, we're seeing how our society is being destroyed by identity politics, particularly just because of that conversation. Mm. That, con- that conversation about just how they see the world. Mm, it's, a, it's a conversation about it's really a philosophical conversation and which, which, which the sad thing is that we don't do philosophy no, no, well, it's, it's a philosophical conversation about how who how the world what constitutes the world and who runs the world and what's the worldview that the world needs to take mm. Mm, and we are stuck in that conversation now I mean 22 elections is now the conversation has now organically come home properly yeah, but we don't have the philosophical tools to tear it apart because, and maybe you can explain why we do this. Why is it that we think of personalities? What is the, the process of always personalizing uh, some of these issues? I'm more empathetic to, to Kenyans around, again, again, just to take us back because of just our historical experiences uh, in the last 400 years before we were even Kenyans is that we have reached a point in a society where what is real for us, uh, you know, what is real for us is one emotion, but then what, what is real for us is people. Hmm. Oh, oh, I had hmm. not understood that, yes. Hmm. So, so for me, I'm very empathetic I'm to Kenya uh. when say, Mtuangu, you know, Mtuangu syndrome. I mean, people, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean people have dismissed it like, oh, Kenyans can't think about or oh, ideologies and manifestos and all that. But, I'm, but for me, I'm, I'm very empathetic. And I'm saying, yes. listen, we have the Maasai signed a manifesto <laughs> and then they were lied to. Then I didn't have an agreement. I mean, it was, com- it was complete. I mean, uh, you know, the Maasai, the, the Maasai agreement was they were lied to. Uh, Asamoah was killed because he was lied to. And, you know, when we have many, many, hist- even, 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 up, I mean, uh, uh, you know, so funny that even even our current contestation right now in terms of our elections is that because our deputy president is feeling felt that he was lied to by Uru because Alimbo mm. mm. so, But, so, so but what would, about mm. why do people believe like with CBC? That was the main issue I confronted that people were saying we believe the government. I mean, I think the whole idea of blaming the government. So I, th- I think it's what I talked about. That's this psychic turbulence. So where you can't really place what people feel and stuff is almost like we're at a constant the psychic turbulence happening within our souls. So yeah. so we, we don't have the ability to be consistent. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We lack the ability because I mean it's almost like I mean our souls are our souls are you know are possessed. So we don't have the ability to be to be consistent. So and anyway, people, being consistent is very painful in Kenya. People will exactly. attack you even when you remind them, but I said this two years mm. ago, so I'm consistent. Mm. It's, yeah, so even, a very, so, it's very painful. Mm, so even so hence the CBC, con- of course, the CBC conversation, again, it's also, again, it's still part of that conversation that we're, that we're talking about earlier because 
because even we talk to the broad range of CBC uh, advocates and detractors, a lot of the people who are advocating for CBC occupy a particular class society. Mm. Mm. So it's, it's a privileged club. So for them, they're saying it's really the, you know, they're saying if 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 more people can do TVET and you know TVET and mm. uh, and that. So it's really that's, that's really, there's really but there's a part of CBC that you hear is really sort of colonial. It's almost there's a there's a class aristocratic. Of exactly, precisely. Yeah. Mm, where yeah, people hey. saying if you if you're born here, mm. it, but they call that talent. But they are saying if you're mm. born like this, why should you aspire for anything else than what exactly. what you were born to be? Mm. <gasps> mm. Wow. Mm. So, so it's still it's still part of that overarching global narrative that we have been that we have for the past four hundred years we we have been we have ne we have never participated in we have just been spectators instruments of that conversation can you tell us what african philosophy does uh you know looking at people like uh, henry odera oruka mm -hmm. with his sage philosophy and other uh, famous mm -hmm. african philosophers uh where do they fit in this matrix that you have talked about and what are they doing mm -hmm. so i mean so i mean so we respond to this matrix depending on our positionality depending on where we are because it's it's constantly evolving and importantly since we are not part of it it was imposed on us we're constantly trying to survive it mm. so i think uh for african philosophy in africa uh i think there's there's a lot of work that has been done there you know and and i'll talk about uh, uh but then also some of the works of lewis godon and there is Gondon and other philosophers who are not uh, based in Africa, but are part of the global African community. So I think for, in my view, some of the works of when, when we're currently talking about sage philosophy, uh, sage philosophy, what, in my view, what he was attempting to do was, was then do with what the German Kai Kressler says in Philosophizing in Mombasa, that philosophy is imbued out of human societies. Mm. So in our interaction, because if being philosophical is also being human. Mm. So, but what, what Uruka was trying to do was he was trying to, he was trying to repair, in, in, uh -huh. in my view. He was trying to repair. When he's talking about, I mean, that we can pick sage philosophy from local thinkers in, in you know, local thinkers, in the, he was trying to repair. So mm. in a sense, his project in many, in many ways, I mean, he didn't really take off completely, but in many ways it was a project of trying to uh, repairing saying that, listen, that since philosoph being philosophical is human, mm -hmm. that we, we also were partaking in these things. So it goes to the Luo community, it goes to the Luo community. He says, you can see that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level of thought processes that happen that actually this is philosophical. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, then he was fought because the, the, the Western philosophy said, I mean, said, no, 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 Western philosophy has only one way of thinking. So it, again, it was, it was, it was, it was, put in a box and say, no, no, it has to be, there's only one way of thinking and it's Western philosophy. And that was, in my view, uh, wrong. Uh, but studying now, because of now works of particularly colonial scholars, Mignolo, Vihano, Lewis Gordon, uh, is because we need to locate, what Shankar and Diop said, we need to locate our thought as Africans back to the civilization of Egypt. Because now, we have to for, for African philosophy to now take off, to now take off and moving it from a conversation around freedom, because this is this is what we are grappling with existentially. Around yes. freedom, identity, moving from a place where now we're now able to move. We have to locate it back to its proper historical context. Because Western 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 philosophy, uh, now this is this is this is it's now at least because of technology and digital, uh, it follows a uh, a, a falsified historical trajectory. So it argues and says it began with the Greeks, Greek ancient philosophy, which is the Greeks, you know, the, the pre Socratic, Heraclitus, and Elea, etc., to uh, the, to, the, you know, and the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then medieval philosophy, you know, uh, St. Augustine, uh, who was an African, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Moses Maimonides, etc., and then you know, and also the, the Islamic thinkers, you know, Avicenna, Averroi, T.C., and then modern philosophy, which is now 
age of renaissance and later so john locke john locke hume all these people and then contemporary philosophy then african philosophy is put in contemporary philosophy so it's so the argument there is you guys are not doing anything until anything. until the 20th century <laughs> but which is interesting i mean chancellor williams chancellor williams in his book uh check and to in his book uh document i mean document that actually are played to socrates uh, uh and many other greek thinkers spent more than 14 years in egypt uh so clearly uh they were studying philosophy in an african black civilization that's where we need to center african philosophy from mm-hmm. mm, for us to conceptually take off and and, and not be what we are caught up in that ideological trap of colonization of time and space by western philosophy mm. so mm, so so that's what, that's what, that's where we need to so you find uh once we will now say that's where we need to take that's our take off point for our philosophy and we are starting from uh the egyptian civilization and we're saying okay these guys actually the greeks came here but also even moving further which is already be done by historians is that the greek the greek civilization was not a european civilization it was a mediterranean civilization so it was looking more towards even uh, uh africa than it was towards europe mm. and, and 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 this and this is this is my view so the, the games the thinkers when they were inventing europe did very 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 well very 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 well so what happens is that because of that trap african philosophy can't take off one on one hand because of the colonization how it has been put in the tradition of philosophy but then two at a political level because of uh in a sense because of coloniality that faces africans and many people in the, the two thirds world so our philosophy is still pegged on we're still talking about freedom, which is important freedom identity mm, mm. but but how because now that means we have to now start thinking about how do we create our civilizations you know back to that space so um what would you say is the way for an ordinary kenyan who does not intend to go back to school what are the things that we need to do at a very ordinary level to i don't know what would we be doing is it to recapture philos- philosophy to connect philosophy i mean what what should we be be aiming for uh, mm. when it comes to philosophy mm. i think i mean at an ordinary level i think philosophy philosophical discourse is connecting to oneself uh the ordinary kenyan because again of our experiences and our daily experiences <laughs> uh everything around you wants to disconnect you from yourself yes mm, so the so and that's a subversive element of doing philosophy in africa is that you you you're trying to reconnect to yourself where everything around you wants you to disconnect to yourself Okay um that's so, so quite it, abstract but i mean yeah it is yeah. so it's, what it's does really... it mean when when they're saying because i know uh when you and poor talked about this once about you know when it comes to religion go to the church education go to the school um, um politics go to media but so and all these things are pulling uh, us apart, apart. and they're doing what so, they're doing what thing is they are they're, they're creating they're sustaining that double consciousness they're dividing our souls mm. 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 because at the core of philosophical work is soul work is trying to put your soul together so that your soul can articulate its its essence to the world so so at a societal level that actually what it's actually philosophy at a societal level is actually a healing process for society to try and put our soul souls back together mm. Mm. so that we can articulate the essence of that soul to the world and to so, each other so that means also it's about how we have our conversations we exactly. can't keep on doing this thing of uh fragmenting conversations you know the way people do a lot of what aboutism yeah they say one thing they say but what about <laughs> mm. that, <laughs> so that's one part, already that's one part broken of the conversation exactly. that's one part of your soul saying this mm. Yeah so so that you put things together and not say exactly. we have to talk about this separately from this exactly because because it tied that's it what you're saying is actually uh uh Plato and Aristotle defined reason 
and I'm sure, I'm sure they were taught in Egypt, reason as not, not, not as what an element of thinkers talk about, which is, I think, therefore I am, as Descartes says, they define reason as the rational activity of the soul. Mm. Mm, mm. So th thinking, thinking is a soul activity. I know for the, the enlightenment thinkers, I think therefore I am Descartes, for them thinking was a mental, mental only. Mm, but for us, it's a soul activity. So it's, the soul is what puts everything together, the mind, the emotions, the body. Mm. So when you die is when you, you, you've stopped thinking. So I think for us as a society is, how do we put the soul together so we can think as a society? Hey. I think the struggle for Kenyans who are listening, who will be listening and who will be, who are, the, it will be like, what does that mean practically? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would you like to help us or we just leave it there and then? No, no, no. I think, I mean, I am on that journey because I mean, I'm, oh, not, yes. I'm, not, I'm on that journey as well. I'm on, I'm, I'm on that journey. I think it's practically, I think, is one to understand first and foremost, your place in the world and to embrace, to negotiate from that place in the world. Mm. Mm. I think practically, so to begin to understand, when I, when I talk about like the matrix of power, to understand where we occupy in, in that space and to begin to negotiate from that space. And I think, and that, that comes from now, where we, it'll take very many forms, very many forms of political activism, scholarly work, uh, scholarly works, but you're, you're constantly Storytelling. Mm. Storytelling, 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 mm. storytelling. Because I think for, for particularly for Kenyans and, and Africans, uh, both here and you know, in the diaspora, global, uh, I think one, one, of the, one of the best things, I mean, that, that contestation is actually, we have to stay, stay staying alive. <laughs> because the metrics of power, I mean, we are, we are, we are spectators and clearly, as we have seen since like, this conversation began, they'll use our bodies for their own contestation. So it's, it's, it's actually staying alive and contesting with it and having, constantly having those conversations and doing things and take different forms, different forms. And, and I think I and leave it there because I, I don't want, I don't think it's, it's it, it don't take an existential form and saying we have to become scholars because I think, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the academy is, is a colonial instrument or become activists as well because I mean, because it, and I think it's just, Mm. In, in, a, in a sense, it's really, it's really finding that, finding, finding, finding the, finding the, the, the voice of the soul. Mm. I think storytelling has to be a big part of it, eh? mm. because, uh, like sometimes I tell my my students don't know their parents' stories. I'm not even mm. talking about his story. They don't know, mm. you know, where did their their, what were their parents thinking when they chose certain careers? Uh, why did their parents settle where they did? How did their parents fall in love or not, you know, or break up? There, there seems to be no consciousness among our young people. They don't know where we are coming from. And I'm not talking about the big Africa development, what, whatever, but even the, the personal stories, we don't know them mm. because there's a way in which they are delegitimated de mm. by so. the systems we are in. Mm. But I think, I think, I think stories are also very important because that's how it, it's, 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 you're connecting, you're connecting the, the soul, you're connecting, mm. that's because where you begin to connect how the soul moves and interweaves it, with itself. Mm. Mm. Wow, thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, and I hope people will sort of uh, give me some questions which I can ask you and then I can come back and we can continue this conversation. I hope so. Mm. Yeah. Thank you mm. so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>